My name is Katie Tucker. I am the Associate Director of Promotion at G. Shermer AMP. Um, to my far left is Jesse Rosen, the, the king of the league. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse Rosen, who actually has to uh, leave early, uh, so we will, he'll start, start us off and we will um, have to say goodbye to him without question. Uh, Stephen Paulus here sitting down is a wonderful American composer and an extremely wonderful advocate for new music in this country. Um, and John Nickterlein is the CEO, President and CEO of the American Composers Forum, headquartered here in Minneapolis. Jesse, do you want to? We so we're talking about in a, uh, you know creating a passionate environment for new music and um, the ways that you can reach out to your community and the various things that you can do for little or no money. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Jesse's going to start us off with some examples from his from the New York Bell. Yeah, this is, um, I'm just going to show a couple of clips from the uh, marketing of the Philharmonic's production of the Ligeti, uh, Le Grand Macabre last spring. And um, uh, I'm not going to say more about it, we'll just watch it, it's short, and then uh, we'll talk about what lessons lie in this. You're never any good at this song. Sadiwa, you're a street as a Baza Aedis. Yeah, were those your formative years? The bullets, these will buy the Castella. Oh, Stoba, Stoba. Yes, pay up. Zoka Tonaga, Gilbata. Do Blasis? You're on. Oh. Pistachio? Jacko, John Di Malfava Giga. I had no idea you liked pistachio. Gina Gamos, and I took on a lot of Uh, you got, you got a little something. It's not. All right. Oh, what is that? So right from the opening bassoon solo, it was already a mad scene. People were angry, they were shouting. Sha, 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 rock this bravable. I love telling this story. Oh, John Bai, do good my refusing mas plazina. It was in Paris, and in the intermission, they had to call the police. There was so much noise that the dancers couldn't even hear the music. It was utter chaos. I decided, okay, let's get everybody together in a room and let's talk about what this is and where we're going with it and how we can think of interesting, innovative ways to get the information out. Well, I, it was the first such meeting that I, that I called and I remember thinking, can I do this? Am I allowed to call a meeting? So, uh, this was the, uh, the, the social media campaign and uh, for any of you who don't know, the, the context behind this was that um, three weeks before the first performance was scheduled, Avery Fisher Hall had only sold 30% uh, of the available seats. And um, Alan uh, called a meeting of the senior staff and said, you know, look, guys, we've invested a lot in putting on the show, and I don't want to do it before an empty house. Now let's put our heads together and figure out what we're going to do. And um, I, I want to come back to this uh, in a few moments, but uh, first, just a, a, some general observations from the inside the orchestra perspective of what I think is necessary to create a successful environment for 
new music. And I would say that, um, firstly, that it requires an institutional commitment, that it requires a board that values uh, new music performance and is prepared to support it uh, with all of the attendant risks and, and resource uh, requirements, and that not having that will be a significant barrier to being able to be successful. And um, secondly, I think it requires a long-term commitment. And when you look at the communities that have um, developed audiences that are trusting and um, prepared to take a chance on works that they uh, haven't heard before, um, it's usually after a long, long time of building up that trust from uh, a kind of programming and audience development that leads to that. And, you know, if, if you think of uh, Michael Tilson Thomas in San Francisco, when he got there, he began doing a lot of uh, new music. But, of course, you know, he was following a tradition, and then even though his predecessor, uh, uh, Herbert Blumstedt, was not particularly, uh, that wasn't the center of his interest. The San Francisco Symphony was the first, really one of the first major orchestras to have a composer in residence, John Adams, even before Meet the Composer had created their composer in residence program. So, you know, this is an arc of, I don't know, 20, 20 years. Uh, so that when Michael got there, there was already some considerable momentum and, and appetite. So people need to be thinking about this with a long, uh, time horizon. And then finally, I think there is a, a critical role to be played for uh, the music director and the staff of an orchestra, and particularly the music director, to help an organization understand what the particular new piece of music is so that they can both perform it well and also communicate about it in a way that's appropriate to what the new piece is all about. So. You know, this uh, at the end of this clip uh, where Alan called this meeting, I mean, and it was a very cute moment when, when, when I interviewed him and the senior team, and, and he said, you know, I didn't know if I was allowed to call a meeting, but uh, I figured, you know, what do I, what do I have to lose? And I, I really want an audience. So he got everybody together, and um, uh, he said, we, we have to have an audience for this. And um, he... Uh, not he, but really the senior team then began to brainstorm how do we do this. And one of the very first things that they did was they sent the staff down to the workshop where all the sets were being built. And the guy, I forget the guy's name, Doug. Doug Fitch. Yeah, D D Doug, Doug Finch, who developed this whole thing. They, they met with him. They saw the conception. They could see it, touch it, feel it, and begin to get some idea of what this piece was about. And it's, a, it's an absurdist piece of, of music. It's kind of over the top and pretty wacky. And, um, and so the idea of the social media campaign that you saw in the videos emerged very much out of this understanding of how the New York Philharmonic, you know, what they thought this piece uh, represented and um, consequently how they wanted to communicate about it. And so the humor is completely consistent uh, with the work and the social media dimension um, was highly effective. Um, I, I knew the performances were coming up, but I didn't really pay attention until I got an email one day, and it was a, it was a black email. <laughs> you open it, it was all black, and then in big white letters it said, come experience the end of the world as you know it. And that was all that was in the email. In the very bottom it said, you know, New York Philharmonic, Gabriel Fisher Hall, May 17. And that got my attention, you know. And I get a lot of emails about concerts and things. And um, so the uh, social media campaign with all those videos, um, interestingly enough, caught the attention of the New York Times. And the New York Times wrote about it. And they wrote about the social media campaign to sell the concert. And when they did the analysis afterwards about what drove people to the concert, the highest single thing was still the New York Times article about mm -hmm. the, the social media, which is kind, kind of fascinating. But the punchline of the story is they sold out all three performances. And so they, they applied uh, a set of practices that were appropriate to the piece of music, that had the complete endorsement of the music director and the force of the music director, and a creative uh, promotional campaign that was very much in touch with what the reality of the piece was about. And uh, the last time we did a session, Katie said that they have another 
uh, big operatic uh, production coming up this spring, and it sold out practically before they even announced announced, it. announced what it was. Yeah. So, so you know, there's a, an accumulative effect uh, that builds, and so I think I'll I'll stop there and turn this over to our colleagues. Stephen, from the outside looking in to an orchestra, what what experiences have you had that have that have uh, made a premiere or a performance greater than the sum of its parts? Well, I'll talk about that in just one quick second, Katie, but I, I just wanted to comment on Jesse's uh, last thing. It's rather fascinating that the thing that really drove butts into the seats was an article in the Times, but it was an article about the marketing campaign used to supposedly create uh, people, to get people in there. And I think uh, sometimes it's not what we as uh, creators of music would always like. You know, if the New York Times had run a, a huge article on Le Grand Macabre and about the piece and the absurdist music and all that, might have had a fair number of readers, I'm not sure. Well, well they actually did, they did a whole feature in the Sunday Arts and Leisure section. Was that after the article on the marketing thing? No, that was before the article oh, okay. on the marketing thing. But may so. maybe had they not done the marketing thing, the attendance might not have gone up that much. Who knows? Yeah. I mean, it's you, that's armchair quarterbacking or Monday morning, morning, morning quarterbacking. But I think oftentimes um, things that are sort of extra musical bring people in. A lot of times, uh, you know, soloists or composers even uh, have things on their website that are about you know they love to go kayaking or skydiving or something, and that that promotes more interest about the artist and uh, the upcoming performance. Uh, than to write about uh, how many contests they won or where their pieces have been played. It's just sort of a curiosity, I think. But uh, it's something that, regardless of what your opinion is about it, it can't be avoided. You have to sort of address some of those things and entertain them. I, m my best experiences uh, uh, relate to a phrase I've coined, which is build the buzz beforehand. The orchestras that have, have done the, the best job of creating a good experience for me and for some of my colleagues managed to build some sort of buzz about the piece in a similar way to what Jesse was describing, but I haven't had that experience. But it comes both internally and externally. There, there's a, an internal effort on the part of the orchestra. They're, they're well prepared, and y you have on not only the artistic administrator uh, acquainted with what you're doing and in touch, um, but you've got usually the music director oftentimes, and if the music director isn't the conductor for that piece, then it will be the guest conductor, and there's some sort of contact there. And then beyond that, the PR and the marketing people showing some interest and saying, you know, we understand this is an organ concerto. How many have you written? And have you seen the particular organ in, in this hall, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, also the development person sometimes, because they may be in contact with the donors or the patrons who, um, who commissioned the piece. And uh, the, the other staff people, the program annotator, all these people are important. And, and uh, also, uh, last but certainly not least, the box office. So that's a, that's a touch point for a lot of people. Uh, if there's no passion coming from the box office, not that they will have uh, listened to the complete uh, CD library of the uh, incoming composer, but just so they actually even know the composer is on the program. I've had people call and say, yeah, I called to get a ticket for your, uh, your premiere, but I didn't... Uh, I had to ask them, is the Paulist piece on this one? Uh, ju just a minute, let me check. You know, so it's not like they're even completely sure. So I think they need to be up to speed. And then externally, when the orchestras do the best job, they reach out to colleges, to universities, sometimes to uh, you know, other schools, elementary, middle schools, high schools, <laughs> and try and involve you in some talks, um, as well as uh, radio stations and, and print media. And one of the things that uh, John may talk about a little bit is the Composer Institute program that's held here um, was advertised, when I think, in one of the first years at on a radio station called The Current, which is a very eclectic Minnesota public radio station that was created separate from the usual, you know, 99.5 classical music all the time thing. And as a result, uh, that advertising has, has brought in uh, a, a different audience. A complete, you can tell just from the buzz in the audience that these are not people who uh, spend their days usually listening to Brahms 4 or uh, Chopin Polonaise. So, but, but that's great. And as I said uh, to one of the audiences where I attended a con one of these concerts, and some of the questions clearly were brand new. You know, they were like, 
wow, where would you think of that? How would you think of that? But these are people for whom this music was totally unfamiliar, even, even the legacy or the history of it. And Osmo said, these are the kinds of questions we want and from people just like you. So those are putting new people in the seats. And of course, you can't leave out the board. The board can be very important in, uh, in building a passion for the new music rather than thinking, yeah, we've got to do this one piece by you know, someone we've never heard of. That. We, have a, we have three new pieces we're very excited about them, you know, two are by these composers and one is by this one. So that, that's at least a start. Sure. And there are also a number of service organizations. There's actually a, a piece of paper on your tables with lists of various service organizations in the United States that um, can help you get funding and meet composers, and one of them is sitting right here. Um, <clears throat> The American Composers Forum is based here in the Twin Cities, and um, I think when we talk about creating a passionate environment, one of the reasons I think things are pretty cool in the Twin Cities is that this organization has been around for 35 years. It was started by my friend sitting here to my left and his other student friends when they were at the University of Minnesota 35 years ago, and they had no idea when they were creating that organization what it would become. Um, but yes, I think having an external resource like the forum um, certainly has helped this community create a buzz about new music, whether it's orchestral or choral or new music ensemble. Um, what I think, I just wanted to say a couple things about the resources available to anyone who are who, who are thinking about new music and how to how to. Um, work with it. Um, other than the forum here, there is another national organization in New York. Um, there's two right now called American Music Center and Meet the Composer. Most of you have heard of those. Um, you may not have heard that they are merging and by the end of this calendar year they will be called New Music USA. Um, and that is going to be a huge resource as well for you. Ed Harsh who runs it is a colleague of mine and together we are nationally trying to work in uh, complementary ways to further the work of living composers in this country and we do it in different ways um, but we are there and I, I think one of the reasons I'm on this panel is just to remind people we are here to serve as a resource if not for money just for someone to talk to um, Ed and I both um, are out there saying if you just have a question you have no clue just pick up the phone and call or send an email um, we're real easy to talk to and we may not have the perfect answer but you know sometimes it's easier to talk to someone <laughs> about your problems with how to promote new music um, the institute that steve just mentioned here at minnesota has uh, been in in play now the institute itself for ten years but um, it started even before that as a reading session called perfect pitch um, and all it was was two days of readings and four or five composers were chosen they came in and the orchestra used some unused services for a reading and then everyone went home um, and then, of course, it grew into the Institute, which is now a week-long thing that ends with a concert that is now generally attended by about 1,500 people here in the Twin Cities, and it's become a, an event, a cultural event in the, in the, in the town. And I, I bring that up simply because I think building on what Jesse said in the beginning about um, long view, taking a long view about new music, I think it's really critical. I, I think it's... Um, a strategic decision for any orchestra and should not be thought of as just simply what am I going to program next year? Um, what what composers should we commission? You, I think, have to really think of how it fits into your programming strategically as you relate to your community. Um, in the first group that we just finished, there's a um, co the composer or the conductor David uh, Delta Geyer from South Dakota has a wonderful example of uh, you know out there in in uh, Sioux Falls commissioning a Native American composer to write a piece for orchestra and the Porcupine Singers which was is a famous Native American drumming group from Pine Ridge and of course the history of Pine Ridge with the state of South Dakota is is um, ugly and he reached out as a conductor to to create a piece of music that included that Native American drumming group with a classical orchestra uh, it, it was a long journey for David a very long journey but it paid off in terms of the relevancy we've heard that word now for a couple days of that symphony in that community um, and and that's what I mean by strategic commissioning um, and it doesn't work for everybody in every community but I do think it is one way to think of commissioning new music um, that can really be helpful in terms of making your role 
in the community, something beyond just a performing organization that we all know and love. Um, there's another um, uh, resource for people called Earshot. It's on the list that you've been given, and I'm not sure how many of you know about it. It's a program of the American Composers Orchestra, and they do have a program where they will come into your um, community and help you create a reading session um, as big or as small as you want it to be. Um, and there's some wonderful resources there for you to think about how could I, um, how could I incorporate this kind of thing into what we do. Um, and it's, it's a program that you have to talk to them, but there's, um, you know, there is some funding for, for this kind of thing, for you to actually with, obviously, it's the commitment of your director, it's the commitment of the board and everything, because this is not something you take lightly. But, but that's kind of how you might want to consider starting a reading program. Memphis has done it, Nashville has done it, Buffalo has done it. It's a wonderful um, resource that I just, I take every chance I have to remind people that, that Earshot is out there. Um, and then um, two other things that I just wanted to bring up for you as, as possible thoughts for, for how you um, build a buzz about new music. And it all depends on whether you're commissioning a piece or whether you're playing an old piece. I, I think sometimes people forget by old. I mean something in the last <laughs> 20 to 50 years. <laughs> or it depends. You know, there's a new music ensemble here in town called Zeitgeist. And, and they have an old music series in which they feature the music of Nancaro and, and people like that. I mean, if it's, if it's older than five years, it's old music to them. Um, but I do think uh, programming um, tried and tested new works uh, within the last 20 to 30 years is something that a lot of orchestras um, uh, maybe don't use as much as they can. But um, in terms of commissioning, um, the other thing that we talked about, about in the first session is commissioning clubs. Um, there's one here in Minnesota that was started 20 years ago. I think it was probably one of the first. One of the couples of the commissioning club here is sitting right at this table, David and Judy Ranheim. And it was a very um, uh, certainly prescient and uh, innovative idea back in 91 that six couples would get together and create what is in all, um, uh, by all measures, an investment club. They each put in uh, about $3,000 a year and then they have a a kitty of money and they, they duke it out. They decide. Um, each of the couples comes with an idea of why they should commission Composer X and, and where that commission should be pre premiered, what, who's the performing partner. And it's been an amazing journey. They should tell you about it. They should have their own panel here sometime because there's some great stories of how these people <coughs> literally, um, I think controlled chaos is the word I've heard very often <laughs> for their meetings. Um, but, but what it does is create this core group of people who is really committed to a piece of music and, it, and the partnering uh, performing uh, organization can utilize that as a way to build the buzz about what they're doing. And, and so um, I think commissioning clubs, if you don't have one in your community, think about starting one. It always takes a leader. Um, it takes someone to get the ball rolling, and there's a time commitment um, obviously involved. But I think in the last 20 years, commissioning clubs are no longer new or innovative. Um, but I think um, there's something, something to continually remember, as well as the newest, it's, I don't even know how new it is anymore, micro-commissioning projects. Bang on a Can, of course, started it. Our own orchestra here in Minnesota did it with their Inside the Classic series. and. They've raised twenty thousand dollars in in five and ten dollar bills um, for a commissioning project that's next year, and now they've got a huge audience that can't wait. You know, I mean, these are things that I think everybody has read about and heard about, but certainly our our resources and I or Ed Harsh at Meet the Composer are certainly willing to talk to anybody if they've got questions about how to do that. And my last thought is to remember that. There are more than just two composer organizations in this country. No matter where you live, I guarantee you there's a group of composers in your town that have some kind of loose association. And if you can reach out and find them, you might have a real ally in what you're trying to do in, in terms of trying to promote whatever you're trying to do at your orchestra.